Legal Eagles, and welcome to episode four of the Global Lawyer Podcast, brought to you by the Sao Paulo Lawyers Institute in honor of its 150th anniversary. I'm Marina, your host. This platform connects legal professionals globally, fostering insightful discussions and sharing expert perspectives on today's most critical legal challenges. Today, I'm delighted to have with us a distinguished guest and a long-standing dear friend, Professor José Garcia Girardi, a renowned professor at FGV Law School in Brazil, who has been a pivotal figure in the field of legal education, especially in developing state-of-the-art teaching methodologies to the academic approach of global law as a new discipline in law schools. His remarkable work over the past couple of decades has significantly influenced contemporary legal education. But more than that, his approach has brought a fresh perspective to the way lawyers should be trained to be capable of practicing in the global arena. Okay, let's jump straight into it. Professor Garces, thank you so much for joining us today. It's an absolute honor to have you here. Your insights and contributions to the legal scholarship have been invaluable. And I can say that from personal experience. We've known each other since um, the early 2000s, which also gives away how long I've been around. Uh, your work has inspired me since then when I first started working with law in English and comparative law. Hi, Marina, and everybody there. Thanks to your over-generous, as friends usually are. It's an enormous pleasure to be here, to be in your show, and to share Great. ideas with you and with all, all the folks out there. Great. And you see, as I emerge from a deep dive into your inspiring article on the legal teaching and the reconceptualizing of the state, I have to say I am captivated by the clarity with which you approach the subject especially by your comprehensive analysis of the elements that make up the foundation of global law and those surrounding it uh, and its implications for the current model of legal education. So to set the stage, uh, let's look at the big picture. I would like to, say, to, to know, uh, you say in your paper that the most consequential issues affecting the lives of nationals in a, in a given country, like climate change, immigration, terrorism, cybersecurity. These issues call for actions that are out of the exclusive reach for national governments. So in your view, uh, would this lead to a new understanding of sovereignty? And what role should legal education play in furthering it? Wow, that is that is something. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, I, mean, I, I think that uh, um, as many scholars uh, have been pointing out, um, the state the state is under tremendous pressure, right, um, for a number of reasons. <clears throat> the the kind of state that we are used to, that we have in our in our minds, sort of, a, I like to say, it's harmless father ghost is the the welfare state and the welfare state is based on industrial capitalism so um <clears throat> the radical transformation in capitalism that we are we are seeing today uh makes the life of the state very difficult because the state machine has been um designed to finance itself via taxes and via industrial taxes it was based mm. on labor, industry, and financing being all in the same territory. Um, we're seeing this disappear. We have financing coming from one side of the world, labor from another one. Um, the dematerialization of economy has made uh, taxation much more complex. It's very, very, very hard to tax um, financial capital for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> This is the interesting. State, this is very interesting. Yes, the state as we know it um, is in a in a in quite a conundrum um, right now, because at the same time that the uh, unemployment is rising and precarious employment is rising, which makes social security 
more needed than ever, uh, states have less and less resources to meet the challenge. And because oh, of they were they were based, uh, they had their 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 money, their wealth, uh, based on on taxes, on capital, and um, sorry, on on industrial capitalism, on, on production, and and work. And so, we need more state, and we have less money. And this, I think, is at the root of um, of the, the 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 malaise with democracy that we see today around the world um, because yeah. of its uh, linkage to the uh, kind of capitalism that we have today, democracy is miserably failing to live up to the expectations of equality that uh, lie at its heart. So to go back to, to, your, um, to your question, yes, I think we have to think of sovereignty in a different way in terms of context. Right, um, but not perhaps we are not abandoning the idea that um, political communities should um, have the right of self determination. This is at the heart of of um, of the idea of sovereignty. So I think from this conceptual standpoint, uh, sovereignty uh, as as a, as a theoretical tool still makes sense. But the conditions in which this this um, sovereignty is exercised have Tremendously changed, and we have to say to see uh, how this impact uh, every day of of uh, the everyday life of populations and uh, and countries. So, yes, it's a it's a total new um, context, and it's I think we mentioned this uh, one of the days when we were talking, and, mm-hmm. and, and that's why the that the notion of global right, um, global law, global governance, global, um, which was almost not her say 20 years ago or maybe 30 years ago mm-hmm. is not only present so uh, we are having a pressure to um, to adopt as the baseline perspective the global and the mm-hmm. second perspective the state as opposed to the traditional uh, international relations perspective in which the unit is the state and uh, the international community is second level but we're still I think in, in in a moment of transformation. Yes, yes. But that's an insightful perspective, Professor. This funding of the state from taxes. I haven't thought about that uh, from that from that standpoint. From the, the funding and the, the, the whole chain of everything that it is connect that is connected is now uh, uh, being uh, it's it's starting to not to, to be tear, to, torn apart. But uh, it is a new, uh, there are new, new, new chains of, uh, of, of connections that right. are being forged, mm-hmm. that are being, being that, that are, that are uh, arising from this, this whole context. So, very, uh, very interesting. No, 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 absolutely. I mean, just, I didn't mean to interrupt, but, but absolutely mm-hmm. just to corroborate what you're saying, uh, say most political parties, and I think Pierre Rosan Vallon, talks about this, most political uh, parties in the Western world um, are based on labor and capital. So you have the labor party almost everywhere and you have the liberal party almost everywhere. And the labor party was based on unions because that was the, their their role right in the, in the production process. I mean, uh, the, the very structure of, of of material production has changed. Has changed. Right. Employment yes. is disappearing. So uh, the economy is dematerializing. And uh, the state, as we know it, has not developed means of facing this new reality. The same way that I think that political theory has not already, has not yet developed um, uh, tools to, to um, make sense of the post uh, industrial world i mm-hmm. definitely think that the institutions of the of the state are not prepared to tackle uh, the new context of the uh, of the global corporate led uh, capitalism and uh, and that's why i think i think maybe linking to what we are talking about today that's why i think that law schools and legal education have a, a central role because yeah. um, what we need now is a new conceptual framework 
to make sense of all that. Um, Thomas Kuhn, uh, in the, the structure of uh, scientific uh, revolutions, uh, talks about the, the collapse of paradigms that requires all of a sudden not an adaptation of the, the former paradigm, but totally new paradigms to describe reality and tackle everyday problems. I think we are at a moment like that. And the people who uh, are supposed to do that are, are legal scholars and legal philosophers. And they happen to be in law schools most of the time. Yes, yes. And you see, and this is uh, also a, a great segue to our next question, because I would say that globalization uh, is said to be causing borders between countries to be gradually wearing away. So what about the effects of globalization on the concept of law, as you were saying, in light of the hegemonic visions of legal positivism as the prevailing school of thought underlying the academic notion of law and its relationship with other disciplines? Uh, yeah. Okay. No, no, that, that is really a great question. Um, first, one thing I, I think it is interesting to point out, mm -hmm. um, Globalization is not doing away with with um, with borders uh, in every sense. On the contrary, uh, I think that right now in Europe, there are there are being built or already in place more than eighteen hundred kilometers of walls mm -hmm. in Europe. <laughs> Talking about the so-called civilized world, 1,800 kilometers oh of walls, right? Um, the I United States, that. we don't even have to say how the, the building of a wall in the, in the Mexican border is a political um, asset for many politicians. Uh, the same time we have um, in the world today, a hundred, I think 117 million people who are refugees. Who, uh, who were forced to flee their homes and have not been accepted elsewhere. So um, the reason I say this is because I think that this dual side of globalization, erasing certain borders, erasing certain hurdles and making others stronger um, has a direct impact on the way we think about law. Now for the economic dynamics of globalization, we need all the things that a business need. We need certainty, predictability, enforcement of contracts, flexibility of labor laws, uh, standardization, so on and so forth. I mean, you're not gonna put your money in a country if you don't have guarantees that you're gonna get your share uh, of profit out of it. Uh, and, and so this requires that lawyers in, in every country and mainly in our case in developing countries are prepared to design exactly the legal framework that's needed for efficient, and uh, inverted comma here, an efficient, efficient economic activity. So that it, it leads us to, uh, so globalization leads us on the one hand to think about law in terms of efficiency, which was not a prime concept for law. Law was not basically about efficiency. That's, that's, that's economy. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but more and more, the World Bank, the IMF, we we changes some recent changes, but the the notion of of the famous or uh, doing business uh, report, uh, the notion of efficiency has become um, integral to to the thinking of law in globalization. It, it was there before, but it. It became stronger because financial and economic transitions became faster, became more globalized. Uh, so on the one hand, globalization has impacted our perception of law uh, in the sense that it has made the economic efficiency and the economic costs of law um, an everyday uh, aspect of consideration. On the other hand, the inequality brought about by globalization has also, uh, I think, made us more perceptive of the um, insufficiency of legality 
as, as, as something that justifies the legal system. I mean, uh, many of, of, of the, the formally sound legal uh, contracts or institutions or relations that we have uh, fly in the face of, of, of basic uh, human, human rights and, and dignity. And so uh, I think that globalization has also uh, made us all think again of uh, legality as um, a per se sufficient reason for upholding the law. So I think that this is yet another split that globalization has created. Um, we are sort of a Mr. Jekyll, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, right? Oh, so yeah. We have a notion of law when it, when it has to do with uh, with economic transactions. We have another notion of law when it has to do with social justice, but these things are in tension. Uh, and I think that the task for us, and I, I definitely, Marina, I really want to congratulate you on your show. Um, I think this kind of, of this debate, of conversation, of dialogue is necessary um, to tackle the, the urgent task of, of bringing these two sides together, of understanding their relation. Uh, because this, I think, is the basis for developing a novel understanding of law that um, surpasses the modern paradigm, which to me seems uh, no longer tenable. Yes. Wow. And uh, yes, we can, <laughs> yes, that, that... This this new uh, world legal legal world war order cannot be uh, we cannot be overstated because we can we must talk about that we must look and you see you are bringing new new lenses when you when you when you answer the first questions uh, the first question and then now with your insights uh, we we have to think about it this must be discussed. And uh, okay, we, we'll talk about that later because I think it's it is worth it's something that is worth the candle the candle if we want to to move further and even if we want Brazil to set the example or to set or to set an example, uh, yeah. this is great. Um, now, considering the practical function of law uh, and the fact that and ironically. Uh, this practical function, for the most part, reflects the academic movements and schools of thought underlying its teaching. How should legal educators approach global law so that it proves enforceable? Uh, what I'm asking is whether we can uh, strike a right balance between theory and practice when it comes to global law, if we consider that it is already a reality, how, how, as a professor, as it's so involved in the process, so how do you see it? Well, that's a tough one too, Marina. You, 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 you certainly prepare a tough of hardball there. <laughs> um, listen, I think I'm going to start uh, by by bringing up a, a distinction that my good friend, Professor Sally Nasir at TV. Uh, always talks about, and I think it's important. So one thing is the law of globalization, and the other thing is the law in globalization. So, mm -hmm. so even domestic law is affected by globalization, but that's not the same way that uh, the law that, in a way, structures the main institutions of globalization um, uh, works. So I think that's a very important distinction, and uh, and. It, it 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 speaks right to the to the connection that you make between theory and practice. Now, <clears throat> there are two levels to this, I think. So, uh, part of, part of, of of the the theory that we make, we make is to uh, is to understand what we want with law. So, why are we putting those values above those other values? Why are you fostering certain uh, arrangements over others? So um, there is an apparently <clears throat> sort of a Monty Python question because it's so broad, right? Uh, but we cannot escape it. What's what's law for, right? It's just a rule of the game. Is, uh, is, is, is law about justice? Is law about order? Is law about allowing every individual to pursue her own goals, 
So uh, this this dimension of law is elemental to to, to determine uh, what we want to do, and then of course you have the practical aspect of deciding how to do it, right? So um, so that's one thing. One thing is is for for law schools to discuss um, the role that law plays um, or should play in everyday life. It, it, it's something and that-, that are, There are multiple, multiple roles. And uh, if you look at them, you, okay, you have, like you said, as you said, uh, you have to look at each of them in order to make each of them work uh, because it is multiple. Because justice, okay, it is, is it the purpose? Well, it, it used to be, but it, it is also justice, of course, uh, and all the others. But but keep keep going. I don't want to interrupt you. No, 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 no. That's the dialogue. That's not interrupting. That's just, <laughs> just exchanging ideas. No, yeah, uh, and, and when we talk about justice, so we're talking about procedural justice or substantive justice. Mm -hmm. Substantive justice is a tremendously tiny, tiny aspect, right? The yeah. words of religion were about us, <laughs> uh, substantive truths, right? So, um, so on, but what I'm trying to say is that one connection is that uh, things that look far fetched and come from from the academia, not only but also from the academia, mm -hmm. saying uh, so what the legal system is. Suppose, suppose if if you convey the idea that um, that the legal system basically represents the rules of the game, right? You probably have a notion that uh, that there is a game being played, uh, that some people will win, some people will lose, and that- who, who the players, who the players are. Who the players are, and, and, and fundamental that is a functional thing because in the game, everybody's at the same time competing and cooperating. Now, if you convey the idea that you no, know, the, Say law it has a function of of correcting social injustices or diminishing inequality. Um, well, that's very different from saying that it is the rules of the game. That maybe that's rules against the rules of the game. So what I'm trying to say is that the first thing is that we have to um, we have to have this ideological horizon to make sense of the multiple functions of law that you mentioned, right? How they relate, yeah, they relate based on this on this ideological um, horizon. And the second thing, which is it's very dear for us, right? Uh, lawyers, mm -hmm. uh, is that law is language. So um, it's not as if we have the same connection between theory and practice in law or in engineering, in law and in chemistry, right? Um, our tools are words. Our tools are concepts, and uh, so there's no way, there's no way you can perform practically without theoretical input. I mean, it's 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 this is it's this is our trade. So, uh, and I think again, talking about the global lawyer, that's the thing we have. We have to deal with these new concepts in a different language, right? With which is English, basically. And uh, which has its own tradition uh, within a certain uh, uh, legal history, and mm -hmm. uh, so and 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 I think that that part of part of our task is preparing uh, global lawyers or lawyers to work in the global world is to help students uh, think about uh, and these issues and try to understand them. Yes, and you see. Even in the very inside English speaking countries, when we, if we take, as I was, as we were speaking uh, before, uh, if we take data privacy as an example, this problem with the, 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 the EU US framework, new framework from the, the 2023, um, there was a legal scholar that was, she was, she was highlighting the differences between the, um, the cultural legal conception of uh, words that are found in the, uh, in the GDPR and in the United States because in, in, the, in, the, in the privacy data privacy protection law in, the, in Europe and in, in the United States, when it comes to the protection of rights in the US, the uh, rights of EU 
citizens and residents in the United States when their data, uh, when, when there is a transfer of the data into to the United States. And there are parameters that must be uh, followed, that must be observed, that involve the words uh, necessity, transparency, proportionality, and uh, what is, uh, is, I was amazed by that. Even the concept of um, the conceptual uh, legal notion of uh, data privacy or data protection in the EU, it is um, an individual uh, human right. It is, a, it, it, is, it is enshrined in the, in, the, in the EU treaty. Whereas in the US, it is, it, is a, it is a right, it should be protected, of course, but it, is, it has another dimension in terms of, 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 um, uh, of relevance for the individual. So even inside, so you have to, uh, the, uh, legal, legal, this, uh, I, I was saying that because uh, global lawyers must be able to, to tackle these differences, to, to navigate these, uh, these uh, circumstantial, uh, these subtle uh, concepts and historical and cultural differences, uh, which is precisely what global law is intended to address. Right, and, 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 I, and I, I mean, we are Brazilians, right? We, the, the, the two of us are Brazilians, and uh, and we and we, I think most of the people will be listening to us. Uh, and everybody uh, can tell a story of feeling uncomfortable or inadequate in an English speaking uh, environment, right? Because uh, she or he felt unable to to convey their ideas uh, in a proper manner, and. Oftentimes, this, these people are much more brilliant than the the the, the native speakers they're they're talking with. So the idea is, this is a psychological individual thing, but when we're discussing rights, when you're discussing legislation, uh, there is there is a power difference between uh, people who say. Well, I'm using this word. It comes from my tradition, uh, from our legal tradition, and basically normatives will be based on this conception. So there is a transfer of power from mastery of language to control of normativity, and that's, wow. that's tremendously that's tremendously problematic. That's yes. Tremendously yes. Problematic. Ooh, I mean, well, we have to. Yeah. We have to say that well, if, if this if this is going to oh be my. normative for the global world, um, the very meaning of this word has to be renegotiated uh, uh, from the from the viewpoint of different and sometimes conflicting and maybe uh, irreconcilable traditions. So I cannot uh, stress enough how sensitive this point is. I think uh, it is. I think language can be a Trojan horse mm -hmm. to pass on uh, legal structures to uh, other countries from different traditions who have different values, different horizons. Uh, with, this, with, with the appearance of just being a, a, a linguistic um, accuracy problem, it is not. It's a power problem. It's, it's a problem of making one legal wow. tradition standard and other legal traditions peripheral. And uh, and and I think that this this has to be tackled. And you know what? If you're preparing legal lawyers, uh, we are we have to prepare them to say no. You mean global lawyers? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Global lawyers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, legal lawyers is, is fine. But anyway, yes. uh, global if you're preparing uh, global, global lawyers. lawyers to to act in the legal in the global arena. I think I think they have at least to be aware that there is this game there, uh, the use of language mastery to impose um, uh, legal uh, rationality, and this is this is really really problematic, and it erases the tradition, the sensitivity, the values of whole communities, and yes. based on, on on a linguistic pretense. Yes, and you see, uh, um, there's something I, I'm working on. 
this is a, a bit uh, academic or theoretical, but um, I'm I'm considering here just just to, to share since you you raised this point, uh, I'm working on the theoretic grounds that could uh, consider in defending that today more than legal English, we should be concerned with law in English. And this is a, a bit, it's, a, it's subtle, but I would like to say that legal uh, as an adjective kind of reduces the role of English as a lingua franca in the legal scenario. I don't know if you agree with me, but let me just finish. Whereas law in English would in fact enlarge it or make it more comprehensive in terms of scope. So, uh, and I'm saying that, if, for instance, uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the understanding of legal systems, different legal systems, law in English would encompass not just the language skills needed for legal practice, but also the, understandings of, the, the understanding of legal principles, doctrines, and systems in the English-speaking world, which is more than one, it means more than one country, more than one jurisdiction. Uh, adding includes the study of case law, statutes, and legal comment commentaries in, in, in English, providing a deeper insight into the common law and other legal traditions uh, as well. Whereas legal English would typically focus uh, on the terminology, the drafting and communication skills, which of course are very, really, really important uh, and required for legal practice, but uh, legal English might limit the scope of language proficiency rather than a holistic understanding of the law. I don't know. We had to talk about that uh, on, well, a, on a coffee uh, one day. I totally agree with you, maybe. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, and I think you have a very strong point there. So when I say legal English, I mean, the now is English. So basically, you were a language teacher, right? <laughs> you're, you're a yes. language teacher, right? Uh, helping people be proficient to, um, to operate. Communicate. To communicate and practice in a certain legal environment. So, but basically it's a language class, mm -hmm. basically it's English, right? Now, when you say law in English, now what are you talking about is law? Yes, your, yes, it is law. It's legal well, English, the, fo the focus is on English. Law in English, the focus changes, turns to the law. Absolutely, and then, and then the moment you say, law in English, you, you make it very clear that's just one possibility for thinking about law because we could have law in Portuguese, law in French, law in other languages. So, and you, you also it. opened the door to, um, to exactly the debate uh, um, I was trying to highlight uh, uh, a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. that there's a power element in deciding uh, the uh, lingua franca uh, for, for law. And uh, and I think that this is this is a major major thing to to think and and I think that your work goes right um, in the right direction and uh, forcefully in the right direction uh, in this in this reflection. Thank you, thank you. We'll talk about that uh, even uh, afterwards, and we will still uh, uh, dive uh, uh, dive into this 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 subject because it is something that has. Uh, taken me from uh, uh it's been a while that i've been thinking about that and because as we teach as we work with the students with uh, students with an international interest uh it's and it's increasingly uh, there, there are many many students interested in that so we i i've been shifting my my focus um and okay what do they need right they need law they need law in English. Uh, okay, so now let's let's uh, move on. From where you stand, what are the likely contributions of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary teaching methods in the study of global law when it comes to conceptual integration? Well, we were talking about borders a few minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think if there are borders that have really been erased are the disciplinary borders. So um, it, it's 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 impossible to disconnect law um, from its economic, social, political impact um, and hermeneutics. It, it's it's not impossible because 
in, in the real world, things are entangled, but it's impossible even from a theoretical viewpoint. I mean, how can you understand uh, an institution, uh, a statute, a, a decision, without uh, comprehending the setting in which uh, these institutions work? So it's absolutely vital. It's absolutely vital. And I think that the, the trick now is to uh, help law students master the specificity of legal reasoning, but develop this mastery in, in contact uh, with, other, with other disciplines. And I think that um, this is especially important uh, in terms of in, in the global setting because in, in the global setting for law, because um, as we multiply the jurisdictions and the traditions that are in contact, uh, we also multiply the economic, legal, political uh, content that these traditions bring on. So mm -hmm. uh, we have to 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 be mindful of all these other dimensions to um, to be able to paradox paradoxically to be able to understand uh, the contribution that that law specific uh, contribution that law can give. And I think that this is getting more and more uh, accepted. I think that when mm -hmm. this year in Brazil, when we started uh, GV at over 20 years ago, uh, there was a little bit of questioning whether this thing based on case studies or problem based or um, if this could create good law scholars and uh, good jurists and mm -hmm. i think that this is uh, this is accepted today that this is probably um a very very productive way of of, of learning law so i think i i'm absolutely in favor of that and um, with this caveat we are not forming economists we are not forming sociologists fair enough not, fair enough no we are educating lawyers but to be a lawyer is to to understand all those things. Yes. Otherwise, you won't be able to to be deal with the problems or to be a lawyer to to be practice. Lawyer. Yeah, yes. the role of interdisciplinary approaches in legal education. Yes, it cannot be overstated because it it is it's it's about incorporating insights from from fields like uh, as you said economics, sociology, and technology, and they they can in, not not only enrich uh, the legal curriculum but better equip students to tackle these all these complex issues. And, uh, and as to multidisciplinary, but we, can, we have interdisciplinary and we have multidisciplinary uh, is also important as well, because when uh, law students work alongside peers from other disciplines, uh, they gain a broader perspective and learn to approach, pro approach problems uh, more holistically, which is invaluable in today's interconnected world. Absolutely. Now, diverse legal system, uh, diverse legal systems, cross-border issues, cultural competency, and language barriers. We, we have already talked uh, a, a bit about that, but uh, what do you believe to be the most critical challenge for legal educators and how should they deal with it? Okay, you have already introduced the subject, but Let's dive deeper. Right. So, so you're talking about in terms of, of the of the global. In, in terms of the in terms of um, classroom challenges. Yeah, I think uh, there are yes, some... when you when you when you work with global law, of course, when you right. when you are preparing global lawyers. But but anyway, so uh, I think there are some enormous challenges that we are facing right now. Um, to name a couple. All our educational system was based on uh, a type of metaphysics that believed that we could find something close to a universal truth. And the, the, the common sense thing was two and two or four, no matter if you're in China or in Brazil or something yeah. like that. Um, so there was this idea that if people um, thought correctly, 
um, and had the right information, they would probably agree on the same answer. It's uh, almost a notion of, 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 of the hard sciences becoming the paradigm for, for thinking. You have to prove it. And uh, once it's proven, it cannot be disproven unless, of yes. course, it becomes mm -hmm. but, but the notion that there is one right answer uh, was at the heart of our educational system. This thing has disappeared. So not only uh, don't we believe anymore in this uh, in this absolute truth or at least universal truth. Universal truth. We 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 often um, accuse this very idea of, of saying that there is a, a universal truth uh, to be uh, something. An instrument of power, basically deployed by white men, heterosexual men, Western men, right? That control what truth is, and uh, this deconstruction mm -hmm. of truth and metaphysic has come to the classroom. So this is one big problem, and for law, uh, this has created another tremendous challenge, which is. Um, Modern law found the universality of law a good thing. The same law for everyone. Of course, they, it found it a good thing because it was opposed to the ancien regime in which people have different uh, normative systems according to uh, uh, where they were born or to, to whose family they were born. So mm -hmm. the same law for everyone, citizenship, was was a great thing. And uh, nowadays, more and more, the idea of a universal law and neutral citizenship seems very problematic. I mean, well, the same law for people in very different social conditions, what is that? And the third challenge that we have in the in the classroom nowadays, uh, the, the, tradition, the traditional classroom is based on roles, not on individualities. So when I am when I am there in front of the class, I'm a role. I'm the professor. I'm not the right, <laughs> uh, and my students are, traditionally speaking, my students are not all the, uh, our students. They are not individuals. Now, this notion has been deeply problematized. Uh, I am my history. I am my gender. I am my options. I am my everything, and so are my students. And. Uh, should these elements be relevant in the in the classroom and how and to what extent so i think that the main challenge that we have today in the classroom no matter uh regardless of other aspects but in the classroom is uh, and in the classroom in law schools are the collapse of the notion of a, a, a common universal and uh, the collapse of the divide between role and individual. Uh, this, to my view, wow. actually undermines the possibility of our having an educational system the way we have today. I believe that this is over. I believe the educational system as we know it today is over, is a titanic, right? It will take a lot of time to sink. But is it, it is already going down. And again, as, as people who work with us, I think it is our duty to, to, to create a new utopia, to create what uh, we think should be in the future. Wow, wow, wow. I, okay, now I'm speechless. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow, this is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's funny but, because, uh, sorry, uh, Marina, just you, I mean, when you stop to think about it, um, all this debate about identity, social inequality, mm -hmm. uh, uh, collapse of metaphysics, who has been going out, going on in theory for forever, at least since the 70s, 1970s, mm -hmm. who has already uh, filtered into social debate, the media, you get the newspapers today, in, in political um, formation, so on and so forth. How could this not be present in the classroom? No, and it has it to is, be. And once it, it got there, I mean, it, it exploded from 
the inside, the whole whole set of premises of modern education, which were up to yesterday, uh, still uh, hegemonic or are still hegemonic in our world. Yes, and I think that this goes towards, it's going to land into efficiency at the end of the day because it travels through, okay, it's something that you do uh, in the classroom, so that that is going to to reverberate. <laughs> it's going to 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 be felt outside. Uh, and more or less like the, okay, I, I would no, I, I would say that you you uh, learn locally and teach globally, but it's not it's not quite like that. It's um, it's trying to forge uh, to 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 create a new a whole new perspective and a whole new um, using a whole new set of tools so that every, so that the, the uh, towards the efficiency efficiency uh, I, I, I would say uh, something that is justice efficient equal efficient and uh, and uh, all these uh, this, this efficiency towards a better living together because this is all this is what law is all about is the science of living together yeah yeah absolutely i think it's a beautiful definition and uh, and and i think so also that um within legal education these problems appear uh differently so it depends the more a school is connected to uh say to, to global financial capitalism. And the more these issues are likely to, to be very present. To interfere. Yes, yes. The less a school is, is linked to this global transformation, the, the more it's linked to traditional modes of production, um, the less likely this, uh, these issues are, I think, to erupt in the classroom. Why? Because, uh, again, Capitalism is not a mode of production, it's a mode of organizing life as a whole. And we have in our country and yes. among countries, different stages of capitalism happening at the same time. Of course, the intermediate is a dominant financial capitalism today, but uh, parts of the country are still heavily industrial, parts of the country are, are still heavily agricultural. Mm -hmm. and so, so, forth. so uh, the way people perceive law society and the classroom in these different environments is different so i think a very nice way of of understanding um these issues that we've been talking about is to look with a respectful care of the different different types of law schools that we have around the country and the functions they perform and i think that this will shed light on why mm. the, the topic of global lawyers and global law has emerged in the in the big megalopolis, and it's a most a non-issue in in many other places. So oh, I think this this can gives us a a bit of perspective in all this. Yes, yes, wow, and uh, okay, we're I'm looking at at our our sequence here. Uh, can we fit? How can can we? Okay, do you re, do you believe? No. Rephrasing, how relevant do you believe that practical training is now going down to earth, moving to, to a more practical um, uh, understanding of it? How often would you say that clinics, moot courts, and hands-on experience should be integrated into the classroom activities? Because you provide this, okay, ideally, we provide this, uh, this um, comprehensive um uh, theoretically comprehensive view of the law and the functions of the law and the, the scope of the law. And uh, in terms of practice, what do you think that might be of use to supplement or to complement or to supplement the all these uh, this framework, this this uh, this theory that is uh, that is that that is so necessary so needed, but it must be, but that, that all must also be practiced, but put into practice. That's another great question. I, I think it is dialectical. I mean, it's not only that you, you, 
you uh, learn theory and then you go to practice, but it's practice that makes you able to understand and create theory. So uh, those two things should go hand in hand. Um, in what regards the amount of hours that, I mean, it depends on each course, you have to think of a course as a whole, but mm -hmm. I, I'd like to say a few words about the nature of the experience that we're talking about. Um, yes, that's better. Uh, that's sheer, a better... Sheer, uh, sheer practice doesn't make you learn anything other than mechanical uh, actions, right? So that's why sometimes when students uh, start their stage in the first year of law schools, mm -hmm. they believe they're they believe they are learning, but after two months they they realize they've been just doing mechanical chores and they are really no better in understanding law than if they had had not done that. Yeah. So so I think that practice uh can only become experience and knowledge if uh, you were called upon to think about your practice, to think critically about your practice, the meaning of your practice and what. So, and uh, so I think it is very important that law schools provide this with you know, book cases, as you said, words and hands-on mm -hmm. things, but crucially one, to expose students to tasks they will not do when they start working as young lawyers, because nobody's, uh -huh. Nobody's going to call them to say to decide on which type of contract they believe is more relevant for a certain business. No, mm -hmm. they're, they're going to be called to, to to do something mechanical. To follow or, to follow the yes, right? To do follow the flow, diligence or whatever. To just do something that a computer can't do yet. Mm -hmm. or, yes, yes, and, uh, yet. And this and this is good for the law office, but it's not necessarily good for the student. So. Law schools, I think, must give students to experience, as, as implied in your question, experience the need to take practical decisions on complex issues and then make them think about it. Because um, these are actually the, the, the types of activities, thinking critically about practical issues, but in sophisticated environments, that will form them as lawyers, including form them as good uh, uh, in theory. But so I think that it, it's very, very important because of that. Practice per se does not make you it's, yes. any more uh, knowledgeable of law. What, what makes practice transform, translate into experience and into knowledge is reflection upon practice. Critical thinking, critical analysis. Right, and of complex situations. I mean, it's... Of complex situations. What, what can you learn about Juntada de Documentos? I mean, just <laughs> how to clip something? I, yes. There's nothing there. Yeah. Right? So this practice doesn't seem to enhance your understanding of law. So I think that it, it, it's a crucial function of law schools to provide this kind of experiential learning for students. Yes, and I think that this kind of approach... From the from the faculty from 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 the teaching side, uh, in requiring students and in in fostering the critical thinking, it's something that happens at postgraduate studies at at the, at a, at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at an advanced level, but not right out when when they are right uh, uh, out of uh, out of law school, and right. I think that that. Maybe a shift in this approach, because uh, uh, it's precise. Okay, I'm thinking about my my experience. From my experience, the as I as I left law school, it is it is that I I was not ready <laughs> at all. <laughs> but right. in in postgraduate studies, studies where as you are provoked to critic to criticize to analyze to be creative using the theory as your main tool, then you become more better equipped as a professional. Absolutely. And, and that's why I think that, I mean, we, we, we try to do this, we do this actually at FGV, which is the, to, to uh, from day one, to present students with problems. Uh, Great. 
that is that is the whole idea, because uh, because that's make them learn and and uh, and that's paradoxically that's why we don't let them work for the first three years, right? Because we want them to develop a certain uh, type of legal reasoning to be that focused, not confined to petty tasks of everyday um, law office life. That might that might give the impression that this is this is law other than what they are studying right right absolutely yeah. okay wow professor this this is <laughs> that's a lot to to take in and as we wrap up because unfortunately we have to wrap up uh what key recommendations would you offer to law school faculties worldwide to effectively address the challenge of implementing global law into their undergraduate curriculum and prepare their students for the complexities of an, an interconnected land, a legal landscape. I think you already <laughs> answered, uh, more or less, you answered the, this question. But just to emphasize uh, a message to, to, to educators, to legal educators. Well, I, I know it would be presumptuous, right? But I mean, I'm going to no. share my... my my ideas about this and uh, just to be to be honest with you and colleagues i think that the key is to have a clear idea of how we perceive globalization globalization has been a, a very controversial um, concept for years um, it is sometimes presented as uh, the best things ever sometimes is presented as evil as it can be. And, uh, and I think that in different parts of the world for different parts of society probably will mean different things. So I think that no matter where we are in the world, we are being affected by this as uh, directly, more or less directly, more or less indirectly. Mm -hmm. So I think that any curriculum, any course, any methodology that will tackle this has to embody and uh, manifest a clear understanding of the, the stand we take on globalization. It doesn't have to be the same for every factor in, in, in schools. Probably would be good if it were different right? Yeah, uh, yeah to respect but, the differences is okay, right. because each environment... It is, it is, I think it is, we have to be very clear about where we stand on globalization, given the specific circumstances of our country's populations, and our common goal of producing uh, more inclusive, uh, more just societies. Wonderful. Oh, Professor. Oh, my God. I can't thank you enough. Uh... It's for me to thank you, Marina. It's been, it's been such a pleasure, a great opportunity. Again, let me emphasize that I think you're doing a very, very important work there. And, uh, and that's it. I mean, we have, to, we have to spread ideas. We have to listen. We have to talk. And, and your show yes. gives people a great, great, great opportunity for doing this. So it's for me to be thankful for you and for all the people who have stayed with us and will hear us uh, uh, later on. Oh, Professor, thank you so much, so much. Oh, okay, so um, your perspectives have been uh, both thought-provoking and inspiring, and they will, they are sinking in, they are, I'm, I will dream, <laughs> I, I will sleep with them, and I will, we have to, to, to speak uh, in the near future again. To our sure. viewers, Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope today's discussion has given you a deeper understanding of the critical importance of integrating uh, global perspectives into legal education. So stay tuned for our next episode where we will continue to explore the dynamic and ever evolving landscape of international law. And until then, keep questioning, keep learning, and keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible in the legal world. I'm Marina, and this has been The Global Lawyer. Goodbye and take care. Thank you. Mm -hmm.